Hello. Hi. We have kind of a weird thing here. The lady that called was calling from Norway. An amazing rescue that could only happen in our wired world. Tonight, we want to give you a head start by beginning with what is likely to be the big story tomorrow when President Bush makes his latest pitch to win back support for the war in Iraq and outlines conditions under which he might start to bring home some troops. The war in Iraq is putting an awful lot of pressure on the White House, and at the president's stop in Denver today, anti war protesters greeted the White House press bus. And while the president may not have seen those demonstrators, we are now seeing some signs that he is getting the message after taking a beating in the polls for weeks. White House correspondent Dana Bash joins me now with the very latest on what we can expect tomorrow. Hi, Dana. Hi, Paula. Well, the message the White House says they are getting is that the American public doesn't necessarily think that the president has an actual clear plan to win in Iraq. So the goal of tomorrow's speech and several others after that is to show that he does. In a preview of what the White House is billing as a major speech on Iraq, the president, while touring the border in El Paso, suggested troops could start coming home from Iraq soon, but warned too soon would be a terrible mistake. I want our troops to come home, but I don't want them to come home without having achieved victory, and we've got a strategy for victory. The president will try to define that strategy before, focusing on progress Iraqis are making in securing their own country. A senior official says Mr. Bush will admit it's taken more time than expected to properly train Iraqi security forces, but he'll cite some 120 Iraqi battalions in the fight, 40 leading missions, and tout specific regions like a road formerly known as Death Street that are now safe and under Iraqi control. The president will make clear more of what he calls Iraqi advances will mean U.S. troops can come home. When that can happen, he says, is still up to his military commanders. That they tell me that the Iraqis are ready to, to take more and more responsibility and that we'll be able to bring some Americans home, I will do that. A Democrat just back from Iraq who wants U.S. troops to stay reports progress but warns it may be slow going. The Iraqis are beginning to show much more self-sufficiency. They're a long way from being able to take it on their own. The White House has tried several times before to turn around slumping support for Iraq with speeches billed as major. After Cindy Sheehan captured August headlines, Bush aides promised to explain their Iraq policy better with this VFW speech. That was two months after using the same tactic with this primetime address. Is the sacrifice worth it? It is worth it. Yet they lost support. In June, 52% of Americans said it wasn't worth going to war. Two months later, 54%. Now 60%, 6 in 10 Americans, say Iraq wasn't worth it. What the headlines say every day in Iraq is how many poor people got blown up and how many American soldiers were killed. That's the reality that's shaping opinions about Iraq. And Bush officials say they believe Americans will be willing to stay in Iraq as long as they think they can win. And that's why that's a word we've already heard the president use more often and likely will continue to do in the next few weeks. And Paula, as I mentioned, they do concede here that the public needs to understand that there is actually a plan in Iraq. And that's why tomorrow morning the White House is going to declassify a 20 plus page document that shows, they will say, that they do have a plan. Paula. Diana, it's, it's pretty clear that the Democrats so far have not had a unified voice in reaction to the prosecution of this war. How are they likely to react to the president's speech tomorrow? Well, you know, we have, we're likely to hear from uh, Senator John Kerry, the president's uh, former uh, opponent in 2004, and we are likely to hear from the Democratic leadership uh, probably talking about what they have said and even voted on in the Senate, which is that they do think it's important for the president to give some kind of general timetable for withdrawal of troops in Iraq. Uh, that's what Democrats in general do have consensus on. But you are exactly right. The one thing that the president, the White House, wants to exploit, if you will, with tomorrow's speech and they want to continue to do is what they see as very clear divides within the Democratic Party about just how to approach Iraq. I saw that today with Senator Joe Lieberman. Uh, writing in the Wall Street Journal and coming out and talking uh, to reporters almost verbatim saying the same things that President Bush has said about staying in Iraq, where on the other hand you have other Democrats uh, saying the opposite, saying the troops should come home immediately. That states. 
But not all of their kids are citizens. In fact, some are illegal immigrants. Critics of birthright citizenship all these in anchor babies entitled to social benefits that can lead to legal resident status for their families. The critics say an incentive for illegal immigrants to give birth in the United States. That fear has been fueled by a report released this year by the Center for Immigration Studies, a Washington think tank that wants stricter limits on immigration. It claims that 383,000, or 42 percent of births to immigrants, are to illegal immigrant mothers. Steve Camarota was the author of the study. One of the things we did was we looked at birth certificate records, source of information that's very valuable uh, on immigrants because it's one place where all immigrants, at least when they have children, come into contact with state authority. The study alleges that births to illegals now account for nearly one out of every ten births in the United States, number disputed by a Mexican-American advocacy group. It's really an exaggeration, both the number and the extent of this notion of anchor babies. John Transvenia says the study is flawed because birth certificates don't reflect the citizenship of the parents, just their place of birth. I don't know how they could come up with it because hospitals don't take into account the citizenship status of uh, pregnant mothers who come in to have children at hospital. Uh, so how they get their number is really unclear to me and unclear to a lot of other demographers. Whatever the facts, the results have touched off a national debate about who has the right to be an American and what anchor babies cost the rest of American society. But both sides agree the debate should not be focused on the issue of birthright citizenship, but on reforming immigration altogether. The same complex issue that has challenged this country for generations. Thelma Gutierrez, CNN, Los Angeles. The idea that you can cross the border just to have a baby who will be a U.S. citizen and then stay in this country legally has a lot of people outraged. And joining me now to debate this, Angelica Salas of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles and Representative Tom Tancredo, a Republican from Colorado who serves on the bipartisan House Immigration Reform Caucus. Good to have both of you with us tonight. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Congressman Tancredo, how big of a is it that illegal immigrants are having children yeah. in this country so that those babies will become U.S. citizens. It's a huge problem and it's growing every single day. There are people coming across the border specifically for the reason of having a child in the United States, having it anchored as a citizen later on then to be able to have that child bring in their family and under family reunification. So many people are doing that, Paula, that there are neonatal wards in hospitals around the country, especially in, in the southern part of the country, uh, southern part of, of uh, the United States border, that have closed their, their neonatal unit. They can't handle it. Th to get this, over 60 percent of the, of the births to uh, mothers in the Los Angeles uh, uh, hospital district are, are to over 60 percent of the births. So to suggest that this is not a problem is, well, it's whistling past the graveyard. Ms. Salas, do you even concede tonight that this is a problem and that this is a burden for U.S. taxpayers? Well, what I do know is that immigrants are coming to this country to work, um, that they are producing tax, tax based um, taxes that actually pay for these um, hospitals. But and are that you denying that they're having children simply so those babies will become U.S. citizens? That is not the reason that they are coming to this country. But it's not happening, isn't it? Well, oh, when, when, you, when Salas, individuals is, you work know that is not true. and when they live in this country, they will obviously have families in this country, and that their children are born in this country and that they're citizens, it's because they are here working, and that's the reason people come. They don't come here to have Ms. Salas, do you know, Ms. Salas, do you know that there are people who show up, and, and I'm not talking about individual incidents, I'm talking about by the hundreds over a period of time. There are people who show up at the border, sometimes in an in a, in a ambulance, sometimes just in a car, about ready to give in order to get into this country and have that birth in the United States. Are you telling me they're working here and just by just happen to be here at the time that they're pregnant? Of course not. You know, ma'am, that this is happening. You cannot suggest that this is not a huge problem. I think that in, any parent wants the very best for their children. And if it means that across the border they're going to have a better life because they are citizens, I think any parent will want the best for their child. However, I do not concede that this is the reason that people are coming right. to this country. Let me ask you this, Congressman Tancredo. We know that it would be <laughs> all God. but impossible well, we don't even have to, a to round point up here. 11 million undocumented workers. 
And there are folks that say that if you did that, the U.S. economy would come to a grinding halt. Okay, let me. Could I have one more word on this anchor baby issue, however, for just a second? Sure. You know, Paula, the, the fact that the uh, we are one of the last countries in the world to continue to do this. Uh, several other countries used to, but threw it away a long time ago. Mexico is the only other country now that allows it. And really, they don't have much of a problem with people going there to have their babies. But the reality is that it is a huge problem. It's an economic problem. It's also, I think, a, a, it's a real issue in terms of what citizenship really means in the United States. Is it just coming across the line to have your kid, and, and then citizenship expands, or is it somewhere important? In terms of your question about the Quickly 11 to, to 20 million people, I'm sorry, I know We've got to close up on this. In, in fact, all you have to do is go after the employer. Stop allowing, I mean, from being the magnet. Don't employ these people because it's against the law to do so. They will go home. You don't have to round up 11 million people. Ms. Salas, final question for you tonight. If a foreign diplomat has a child here in the United States, that child does not become a U.S. citizen. So why shouldn't the, the child of an illegal immigrant mirror the status of his or her parent? Because um, American values basically promote citizen, birthright citizenship. We're a nation of There have been generations of immigrants that have come to this nation. And birthright citizenship allows to become to continue to be integrated as a nation so that people from all over the world can actually be united under their citizenship. We are different than other country in the world. There is no other country um, that whose whose real beginning, its founding, is based on immigrants coming right. to this nation. We and these have are to leave the debate this. here this evening. Angelica Salas, Representative Tancredo, thank you for both of your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move on now. Most thieves will take just about anything that isn't nailed down, but the ones we'll hear about in a minute went above and beyond anything we've ever heard about before. To be so brazen is to actually go on to the uh, set up uh, a work zone, wear hard hats, wear safety vests. So the question is, why would anybody steal street light poles? And not just one or two. We are talking about more than a hundred. And a little bit later on, if you were a judge, how would you sentence a woman who abandoned nearly three dozen kittens? Nine of them ended up dying. We're going to hear it. who got very creative. I'm Ted Rollins in Southern California. Coming up, an amazing story of how this webcam may have saved this woman's life. Her family, half the world, noticed that she collapsed. They called for help. It is an amazing story. We'll have it coming up. When it comes to restoring America's energy, every one of us can lend a hand. Turning down the thermostat, taking your foot off the gas, teaching our children to use energy carefully, and working together to find new supplies. If we all do our part, it will make a world of difference. A message from America's oil and natural gas industry. Do you believe anything possible? I do. I work at Earthlink. I believe internet good can defeat internet evil. A world without spyware, viruses, or online identity theft. I believe in a place where our information can be safe. I won't stop fighting until we get there. We work at Earthlink. And we're making unbelievable things happen every day. It's time to start believing. Call now and get a great deal on Earthlink High Speed. Earthlink, we revolve around you. So much more to see. Shouldn't you be watching it on the Aquas Liquid Television? From Sharp. As soon as anything happens in the world, I rush to CNN, and I know from there I can get the latest information. I can also look at it to find information that's very specific to my coverage. When I need the news, I turn to CNN first because I know it's going to be reliable and trustworthy. CNN All New Tonight at 10. We voted for them, we pay their salaries, and this is how they pay us back? They broke the law. CNN Tonight, 10 Eastern. Data is at 12%. I'm recording bass fishing on ESPN right now. I'm hoping to get that up to 50. I'm going to talk on the phone all night long. Long distance. Right now, there are hundreds of movie stars in my living room waiting. My entire family pictures of my vacation, and none of them can stop me.
I'm an interpreter at the UN. I overheard something today. A deadly threat exposed. You heard a couple of fellows talking about an assassination. Yes. One agent will decide, is she a target <laughs> or a weapon? These guys know what they're doing. Thing. With On Demand, you can start the movie anytime and rewind each suspenseful scene again and again. The Interpreter, now playing On Demand. Movies On Demand, available anytime on Channel 1000. It all comes together in the Situation Room. CNN tomorrow night, 7 Eastern. We need a cell phone. How wicked would that be? If you get a cell phone, we'll go into bankruptcy. A singular cell phone, not a possibility. Did you know you pay? Tis the season for Go Phone, only from Singular, raising the bar. Tonight, when you look out your window tonight, you might be seeing this is what we see as we look out on Columbus Circle on a dreary night. We frankly could live without the steady downpour out there. But if you're living in Baltimore, this is not what you're going to see. Now, police are very hard at work trying to solve a mystery. Who's been stealing the light poles right off the city streets, sometimes even daylight? We sent our Jason Carroll to Baltimore to find out more. This Baltimore is just a little bit darker these nights, thanks to what law enforcement suspects is a small band of criminals that has found a way to steal the light. You woke up every day and you, <laughs> it gets, keeps you out of the routine, that's for sure. <laughs> it is uh, odd. It? it is unusual, I have to admit. It's, it's unusual, it's like this. What they're doing is stealing light three of them in just eight weeks. It's cost the city more than $150,000 to replace them. Tony Walnoffer says in his 30 years at the city's Department of Transportation, he's never seen anything like it. Certainly they have some knowledge of uh, electrical circuitry, all right, so they know what uh, to do when they're down here so that they don't electrocute themselves. Walnoffer says the poles have disappeared from secluded streets at night and from busy streets during the day. The thieves have dressed up like city workers to steal them. To be so brazen is to actually go onto the street, uh, set up uh, a work zone, wear hard hats, wear safety vests. The city says the pole thieves use a chop saw like this to cut them down. It takes less than a minute. But the saws are very loud and the 30-foot poles are heavy, 250 pounds. Still, the thieves have managed not to get caught. A spokesman for the Baltimore Police Department said investigators are looking at several people. He also said investigators do not want the department talking about the case because they don't want the publicity. How can we lose 130 light poles? Local talk radio host Chip Franklin says police have been shamed into silence. The FBI just ranked Baltimore the second most dangerous big city in the nation behind Detroit. Franklin says police can't talk about catching pole thieves controlling more serious crimes like robbery and murder. Then it would be embarrassing to have a press conference, you know, with, <laughs> where's that light? It was just in here. There's humor and speculation about who's doing it and why. One caller voicing a common theory, drug addicts may be the culprit. I was not too far down out drug addict. And anything you could do to hustle a buck, so you would do it. HBO's police drama, The Wire, set in Baltimore, explored the problem of drug addicts stealing metal to cash in for drugs. Mark Decker, a Baltimore scrap metal owner, says the concept isn't new. They're on poles right now, but 10 years ago they were on the copper, you know, breaking into houses and taking all the copper pipes out of houses. Decker says the aluminum poles are worth about $100 each as scrap. He has any at his business. In fact, police say they haven't turned up at any scrap. They suspect the thieves are cashing in outside the city. Tony Walnoffer doesn't think the crime spree will last. I think like any uh, criminal or thief, they come to well too often and, you know, that's what gets them caught. In the meantime, the police are waiting for a lead that will shed some light on the case. Jason Carroll, CNN, Baltimore, Maryland.
So tonight, uh, city officials are trying to keep up with these efficient criminals by actually replacing the missing aluminum light poles as fast as they can. And at the same time, scrap metal dealers are on high alert. The Vatican's long-awaited instruction on gays in the priesthood came out today. Just what does it mean, and it will cool the anger or end the scandals within the Catholic Church? We'll debate that. And a little bit later on, a high-tech rescue that wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago and may send you out to the nearest computer store. The Verizon Wireless Network. It's more than phone calls. It's pictures, music, video, internet. On the go, anytime. More than 50,000 people make this happen. People who are highly trained, knowledge hungry, and never satisfied with good enough. But the best part of being Verizon Wireless, I don't just look forward to the future. I build it. I build it. I build it. We build it. Our people, our network. The medicines, the plastics, the materials, things that make modern life modern come from one place, chemistry. Learn more at AmericanChemistry.com. is your living room. With Samsung leading the way in entertainment on demand, it's not that hard to imagine. Experience Samsung at Sprint Stores now. Burning, itching, but the pain's the worst. I should have used. Preparation H Cream, burning, itching, plus maximum strength pain relief on contact. The most complete relief from Preparation H, pain relief on contact. good at surprising each other with unusual presents. So who'd have ever thought you'd give each other the exact same gift this year? Having a baby changes everything. <laughs> Let's go, girls! <laughs> go places this weekend. 50% off. Rent Friday to Monday. 50% off. Pick Enterprise. We'll pick you up. In the fight against avian flu, Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at ground zero. We decided to go to a place where bird flu actually exists in human beings. How it spreads from birds to people. What's being done to stop the killer flu? Sunday, December 11th, only on CNN. My name is Alejandro Escovedo. I write songs and I sing them for people. I want to make my own opinion. If you give me the truth, I can make up my own mind. If you give me the right to make up my own mind, I'm fine. I just want to be given the facts. I do get that from CNN. CNN All New Tonight at 10. Hundreds of lives lost to the hurricanes of 2005. Billions to rebuild. What the government could have done to keep us safer. Plus, we voted for them. We paid their salaries. Now they're accused of bribery and corruption. CNN Tonight, 10 Eastern. CNN Tonight. Hugh Hefner and the three girlfriends who live with him at the Playboy Mansion. Could one of them become the new Mrs. Hefner? The original Playboy and his three live-in ladies. Larry King Live. CNN Tonight, 9 Eastern. American Morning, what happened overnight, and what's happening in the day ahead. Real news makes the difference. Soledad O'Brien and Miles O'Brien. American Morning, CNN tomorrow morning, 6 Eastern. Now under the controversy raging tonight over gays in the Catholic Church, the Vatican today released its long-awaited policy on gays entering the priesthood. And while the new rules have gay Catholics outraged, those opposed to homosexual priests are claiming a victory. The policy represents the first major ruling from the Vatican under Pope Benedict. Inside its eight pages, rules on who can enter seminaries, the training grounds to be a priest. Banned are men who practice homosexuality, 
present deep-seated homosexual tendencies or support the so-called gay culture. Allowed are men with quoting now a transitory problem they have overcome for three years. What the policy doesn't do is call for a crackdown on homosexuals who are already in the priesthood. The people on both sides say the message is crystal clear. The church doesn't want gay priests. I'm joined now by men on both sides of the debate, Jeff Stone, who comes to us from Dignity USA, an organization of gay and lesbian Catholics, and William Donahue, president of the Catholic League. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. So as a gay Catholic, what do you find most offensive about this new ruling? Uh, I think the most offensive thing, Paula, is the uh, language which talks about deep-seated tendencies. Um, a sexual orientation, by definition, is a deep-seated tendency. And so to say that, that men who are gay, who have a deep-seated tendency, um, who are, intend to be celibate, uh, that they are not suitable for the priesthood, I think, is very insulting to the many uh, gay priests that we already have who are faithfully serving the church. Do you have a problem with that? What are you saying? These these are priests who've pledged to lead celibate lives. In, in that so why should their own gender, their own description, in, in of their sexuality? In that passage, what Jeff is talking about, they also talk about practicing homosexuals and those who support the gay culture. I would say the sub subculture. In other words, this if if a priest is gay and he's gay incidentally, and his master status is that of a priest, and he doesn't have any confusion there, there's room for him in the priesthood. I have met gay priests. They're wonderful priests. I've never been opposed. In fact, I would be opposed to the Vatican if they had an absolute ban. I like the idea of a little bit of wiggle room. But let's face this, Paula, we have not had a pedophilia crisis in the Catholic Church. It's been a homosexual crisis. Look at the National Review Board, what they've said. Look at the John Jay report. 81% of the victims are male. Most of them are post-pubescent. Now, most gay priests are not molesters, but most of the molesters have been gay. Something had to be done. But you say this is absolutely the wrong way of going about it. I, so how, how do you counter those numbers that they'll just at, throw out? And when you look at the at studies of, of human sexuality, of, of pedophilia, first of all, pedophilia and homosexuality are not related in any way, as any credible expert on human sexuality will say. Um, these issues that but you would argue that most pedophiles are gay. No, no, I'm saying in the Catholic Church. I think I, yes, you cannot say that because you're a homosexual, you have a natural tendency to be a pedophile. That is absolutely insane. I am simply saying this: that most of the molestation that took place amongst priests in the Catholic Church, they were hidden on adolescent boys. That is a homosexual problem, no matter how you cut it. I would say. Do you that, concede that? Absolutely not. I would say that it, it, if if a high school teacher, or man, has an affair with a, a, a student of his, is that a heterosexual problem? That is a problem of behavior, and it is totally inappropriate. And we are as outraged by it as anybody is. But somebody who is psychologically and sexually mature does not want to have sex with young people. All right. So the question I want both of you to address right now, as we close this off, is: Will this new ruling stop? the sex abuse scandal in the I, Catholic Church. I think, it, I think it, the sex abuse scandal has already been cleaned up because the message went out a long time ago, hey, fellas, the party's over. The Catholic Church deserves the blame on this for what they did in the 60s and 70s and some of the books that were taught encouraging people to practice sexual expression in the most deviant lifestyle. And then the Catholic Church said, oh, my God, wonder why we have the problem. I think the message has been received. I also want this applied to uh, straight priests. I don't want some straight priest out there hitting on some woman and saying, well, it doesn't apply to me. So does this ruling solve anything as far as your concern will it stop the abuse of either men or women by it, priests? It is not going to stop the sexual abuse crisis. That has to be done by the bishops, and they have not taken responsibility for it. And we still see the crisis unfolding in Los Angeles and Philadelphia and other places. Jeff Stone, William Donahue, thank you both for dropping by tonight. And stay with us and meet one of the most creative judges around. If you've ever done anything wrong, you better not end up in his court. It's what I always, I've always termed as being relevant justice. Make it appropriate to the offense. So wait till you hear how he sentenced a woman who abandoned...